Welcome to Gaming Guide and everybody. This is the podcast that uncovers the side stories of the gaming world as well as the world of Japanese localization. I'm Andrew and we got here Mike. Uh, thank you. It's always good to be here. Uh, in this episode, we are going to be interviewing Jeremy Blaustein. Thank you for coming on. Hey, nice to be here. Thank you for your time. Uh, thanks. Uh, so, yeah, uh, Jeremy Blaustein is a Japanese to English translator and localization coordinator specializing in the localization of video games such as Metal Gear Solid, Castlevania Symphony of the Night, Silent Hill 2, Silent Hill 3, Silent Hill 4, The Room. Citation needed, it says on Wikipedia. But anyway, some Pokemon anime and movies, Contra, Hardcore, Dark Cloud 2, Dragon Warrior 8, uh, 7, uh, Shadow Hearts, Shadow Hearts Covenant. By the way, I heard that this has some of the best dialogue in any RPG um from some people online anyway uh, i would not i would not disagree with that <laughs> and then sweet code n2 valkyrie profile and you were supervisor for snatcher just to name a few thank you again for coming on that's and there's and there's many more to be found as well <laughs> yes all right so let's get started uh at the beginning what is it that got you into japan and the japanese language oh. in the first place Okay. Wow. Right, right off the start. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, I get asked this and, um, it's really, it's, 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 it's not a great answer. Um, the, the thing that got me into it was that I was going to study, I wanted to study a, a very, uh, unusual language at college. Mm -hmm. Um, and my first choice was actually Welsh. Wow. Ooh, okay. Yeah. Welsh. so I, you know, in an alternate dimension, I'm, I'm doing this interview about, all the all the welsh games i translated yeah <laughs> we'd have a very long title that would be very difficult to read for most um so yeah and that was because i was into uh i was into like arthurian legend and i was into uh mm -hmm. lord of the rings and mm -hmm. wales seemed like a very romantic uh medieval kind of a you know yeah. place of great history and, and it was a super weird language and I thought well if I could speak a super weird language then well I'll be in, like an interesting guy or something like this <laughs> and, um, and you know this is I was a freshman in in, uh, in college and mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of amazing when you get in college right because you look in the course catalog and you've got all these things that you can do you know and you've been cooped up mm -hmm. in high school and you had to take your you know home ec or whatever you know boring boring stuff mm -hmm. but in college it's like man what am i going to do i everything's at my fingertips i could study anything yeah and so um i took a course in uh, celtic and um celtic and norse literature hmm. um by the same professor who was teaching welsh and i wanted to take welsh and she said to me uh she's like you know between you and me don't study welsh you know <laughs> like think about your future what are you going to do you know, <laughs> that's so what how she did said. they even have a program? <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know. You know, that's what she said. Um, maybe she, maybe she sensed that I um, was very serious about it. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know. But she, but she said, think of another language. Mm -hmm. So I went back to the course catalog, and I was thinking Russian, Chinese, Japanese. What do I know about these different countries? You know, mm -hmm. and um, for Japan, um, the. I guess the biggest influences on me back then were uh, the TV show Shogun, mm -hmm. All which right. right there was uh, Seven Samurai yeah. by Kurosawa, and there's uh, Sushi. You know? <laughs> and, uh, you know, I mean, I didn't have any strong impressions of Japan. <clears throat> Video games was not um, wasn't really one of the things back then that you would have thought of. Neither was um, anime although you would have thought of probably saturday morning cartoons you know mm -hmm. you know whether yeah. that's um yeah um so i i went back and i and i um decided to do japanese freshman year and uh my dad said uh you know i'm not paying for you to take intensive japanese course eight credits eight hours a week you know you're not studying japanese is ridiculous you know you know you never speak huh. japanese you know it's wow, impossible that's... you know wow. so <laughs> so, I, so, <laughs> so I started studying Japanese my second year of college. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Came on back to it. All right. Yeah, I went back to it. Yeah. Did you then start funding it yourself? Were you working part time to, to do that? Yeah, or I was, did your dad come around to say, I'll help you out? No, I was always working, but uh, dad did come around. 
Okay. And it, what was it that convinced him? Uh, probably my stubbornness. You know. <laughs> yeah. It's not, not a bad trait to have sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. So where is it that you uh, grew up originally before you went off to college? Um, Look at yeah. that catalog. I grew up in um, <clears throat> Long Island, New York. Oh, okay. South Shore, South Shore, Long Island. Um, and then uh, uh, in uh, my high school years, I moved to uh, Chicago area. Oh, okay. Wow. So then I went to college in the Midwest. You really got around there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I had a similar uh, trajectory there. I, I grew oh, up yeah? in the Bronx. Oh, really? Then, yeah. I, I was up and I'm a stone's throw or I was a stone's throw from Long Island. Uh, okay. I was yeah, on the island. I don't mm. know if you know mm. it. It's on the northeast end of the Bronx. I know a little and bit. I went out to high school in Pennsylvania around Philly. And then mm. Mm. and then uh now I'm in the Midwest. <laughs> I do not I do not hear the Bronx accent very much. A little bit. <laughs> well, yeah. you know, that's the thing. When you even though I was living back in the Bronx, when I went to high school, I took a lot of uh I would say I took a lot of flack for it, but it was more like people kind of playfully teasing me and asking me to repeat things. So I kind of found a neutral ground to be understood by everybody. I got it. When I got to uh, the Midwest, people would think that people, I had some people ask me if I was from England. Really? <laughs> yeah. Wow, are you from England? One girl talk... in college thought I was from Australia and I'm from the South. I'm from Georgia and Alabama. So I just thought that was so strange. That is so strange. Yeah. 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 England, huh? Maybe because the R's aren't aren't as strong in the New York accent. Yeah, right? I think no, I think it's because the um, as Mike as Mike knows, you know, in in the Midwest, they they tend to they make their A's really flat. Like they'll say accent. I don't have an accent. Oh right, right, right. <laughs> I don't have an accent, right. so I would say no. That's pronounced accent, and they'd say accent, <laughs> accent. It's not accent. I say no. I said accent, accent. <laughs> oh man they, they couldn't hear the difference uh, and yeah, then there's the transatlantic <clears throat> well there's also the famous uh mary 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 test which mm -hmm. i do I, I perform that on people yeah, like yeah a I mean, uh, it was it was a it was a long time before they started to shift for me growing up there was no difference <laughs> you guys know the mary 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 test mm -hmm. i don't no, think i do andrew doesn't know it what is well, it you got, give him you the, got test? the name you got the name, you got the, the name, so Mary. just, right. And you got, uh, to be happy is to be Mary and to wed someone. Mary. It's all the same to me. Okay. So where are you from? I'm from Georgia. Okay. Well, if Mike says them, you say, them all the, you say them all the same, but I heard them differently from you. Oh, really? I heard them all the same. I mean, Mike, Andrew, same, same all together. Mary, Mary, Mary. I mean, it's all the same to me because the southern yeah. accent makes it makes it all the same. <laughs> all the same. You know? Yeah. But, but, so but, I, like pen and pen and pen, P I N P E N. Southerners yeah. do not make this difference. And this is something I just discovered recently in life. And <laughs> I didn't know that other people in America were pronouncing them differently. So you basically only have one vowel in the South. Only one. There's only one there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all we got. That's <laughs> model of efficiency. But I, I, I would just to, I would say Mary, 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 nice. Mary, Mary. So Mary, Mary, uh, Mary, Mary. Nuanced, nuanced differences, yeah, nice. at least to me. And Mike, you got to do it. Mike, we're sure. not letting you. Now, well, here we go. This is how it would be now, right? Yeah. The name is Mary. Yeah. And that's that still carries over, right? Yeah, and that's like pretty New York. Yeah, and. that's 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 Bronx. Yeah, because because it's a noun, it's a proper name. Mary, yo, Mary, name. yo, Mary. <laughs> where's Mary? Yeah, where's so, Mary? But uh, what I would she was say gonna now pick me up some Mary. cigarettes. <laughs> Get in the car, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> I would say for happy is uh, Mary is how I would say it now. Yeah. But growing up, I only said Mary. It was Mary. Oh, I thought really? It was Mary. I thought it was Mary. The name Mary Christmas. What's the difference? There was no difference. Yeah, you're like me. you're like going back in time, Mike, because you just said I taught. I taught it was Mary. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, and there then, was uh, one time in Japan where uh, it was me and a few other people that weren't from New York, hmm. and you, talking about somebody getting married, and and then you said, 
Yeah, Mike, you said, are oh, you going to get fucking married? And it was just like the most New York thing we'd ever heard. <laughs> we, I remember laughing at that. We all laughed at that. Yeah, it's generally like tucked away. And then the, there are those moments where it comes out and it's a, that's who I am. <laughs> usually when you usually when you curse. Yeah, yeah oh, that's yeah. natural. My father always said, if you want to find out what, what someone's native language is, just stomp their toe. You'll hear Piss it. Them off, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, so I'm sorry, had... I got you guys totally off track. That's no, okay. No, it's, it's all on track. It doesn't matter. Your, it's all your, relevant. Your initial interest was the language itself, nothing mm. as far as anime, manga, gaming. I mean, those yeah. Well, you had well, some movies. Some movies. It was more. It was more. It was more cultural than linguistic, but because mm -hmm. I didn't know anything about the language, but it was really a cultural thing. As so far when as you just uh, like samurai ninja. Yeah, I I think that. You know, when I look back on it now, I realize that, um, first of all, I always felt that America was kind of weird and fucked up, you know. Mm -hmm. I knew there was okay. something, I, I knew there was something wrong with America since the time I was a little kid. <laughs> I, don't, mm -hmm. I did. Um, and, uh, you know, I kind of grew up in a kind of a chaotic, uh, chaotic family a bit, you know, in terms of, um, I suppose... You know, like, no, there was no bedtimes and like no one ever told me to brush my teeth or anything like that. And, mm -hmm. you know, there was like animals around everywhere and stuff like this, you know, mm -hmm. dogs and you know, shit on the floors and stuff. Um, and so I don't know, I, I, I think that now when I look back on it, I think I realized that uh, I had a sense that Japan was a was a culture that had well established um, rules and like modalities of behavior mm -hmm. that um one could look for to provide some structure to uh things mm -hmm. and i think that i didn't feel structured at all and i think yeah. that part of part of me was kind of reaching out for some structure something that made some yeah sense that somebody had some ideas about what would was proper you know mm -hmm. sort of behavior not and, enough discipline in america yeah overall. discipline structure is, yeah, discipline is 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 a is a word for it, I guess. But it's more like um, the well. If you said chaos before, then it's a sense of order. Yeah, it, it's more like it's more like order. Um, I see. The expectation for, um, in other words, in America, everyone sort of behaves differently. Everyone has their no. This is the way I do I this. See. This is the way I do this. Um, and so, how does how does a person determine what's the you know, if everything is, I just do what's best for me, then like, mm -hmm. how do you not have complete chaos? And right. I don't, I didn't realize it at the time, but I think looking back now, I, I, I must have had some, some inner kind of sense of that, looking for that. Yeah. yeah. So it definitely sounds like an adult's perspective, you know? Yeah. It's, you know, you're not exactly sure what you're hungry for as a child. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No. That's an interesting take. Give me one second. I think my TV has turned on magically. One, <laughs> just one second. I'm sorry. You want to mark the right time back. code? <laughs> All right. Yeah. My uh, my grandparents actually bought a house on Long Island at one mm. point. And yeah, where was that? In uh, Seaford. I don't know. Must be I, North I'm not even. I've never even visited it. I mean, I've been out mm, to Long mm, Island plenty mm, of times mm, since then. Mm, but uh, they had God, bought a house there, and they ended up okay didn't go well they ended up back mm, in the mm, Bronx and that's where they mm, were like well we want our mm. compromise similar to where we were in Long Island and they did City I, Island I grew up in a, in a area of um Long Island that was a predominantly uh like um Italian Bronx you know wannabe mm -hmm. Goombas you know and so <laughs> yeah. yeah so I, I was the only Jew I was like the only Jewish <laughs> Jewish kid so I got I tell people I was the only Jewish kid and they're like yeah. but you were on Long Island you know like well, <laughs> in Long Island is really a different thing. <laughs> it's very segregated. So yeah, um, I mean, even in the Bronx, I could say like the the East Side, it's mostly Italian and Irish, and then the yeah. West Side, you had like Riverdale, and it was a predominantly Jewish area. Oh yeah, so my my area was all Italian and Irish, and uh, yeah. it's Joey funny. Like here, hey Joey Butterfuko, hey. We it's people, like I think people in the South really like hearing that kind of stuff because we don't have that like most people have forgotten where their family comes from and mm. so it's, oh. it's literally just white 
and black and not much, not much other, not many other races. There's hardly any Asian or Mexican, mm. even to this mm. day, I'd mm. say. So it's just in Georgia, you said in Georgia, especially Alabama. I mean, I remember oh, there was Africa. one, there was, yeah. I went, I moved from Alabama to Georgia when I was 12, but, and I remember Mickey Escobedo, the mm. only Spanish, the only Mexican kid in the whole school, mm. you know? Mm. So that's how it was back in the day. Mickey's I'm, probably, I'm probably listening changing. to this. Yeah, like, yeah. Andrew, Andrew, Andrew remembers me. Yeah, I remember. He liked baseball. Um, okay, so um, you want to get back to it? Um, yeah. The uh, the last question I had about the language for you was, um, did you, how did you find learning it? What was your experience like actually learning this uh, very different language? Yeah, first year was really hard, and I didn't do very well. Um, that's when you're learning, like, you know, you're learning your hiragana and, mm-hmm. you know, kind of those basic things and um but i continued and then my second year i started i started doing well it's when you Mm -hmm. um so yeah it was that second year i decided oh i can do this you know i I never had any sense that i could learn another language i was not proficient in high school in Mm -hmm. i took german and i didn't Mm -hmm. i didn't do very well i didn't Mm -hmm. i didn't have any sense i'll ever speak another language but Mm -hmm. um japanese i just kind of uh endured it Mm. Okay. excelled yeah. was All there right. any part in particular you were you felt like you what was what was the worst and what was the easiest like speaking reading writing mm. listening man that's a good question but i'm not sure that i i remember probably i think i, I might have been the best at kanji yeah okay. I, I would, you know i would just get really um well I, it's a, no, I, I don't want to say that. I was in college <laughs> and, you know, it was my preferred study method. I'll just leave it to your imagination. Yeah. Okay. Copy that. <laughs> okay. So uh, did you, I mean, I ask this question sometimes because I had language shock when I first started learning. I call it language shock, mm. just learning how, learning just how different Japanese could be. Cause the only other language I had ever study with Spanish because it was literally the mm. only language they offered in my high school. So I remember studying in a book and the it was like some kind mm. of almost nonsense, grammatically correct, but almost nonsense mm. Uh, mm. Uh, 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 example sentence. And it was like, Chika tetsude posto miru yoni natta. Like, <laughs> what? I, <laughs> posto. Posta. Post, uh, posta. Posta. Ne? Oh, okay, okay. So the translation, you know, <laughs> yeah. I, well, I, 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 I have <laughs> come to uh, be able to read. watch <laughs> look at more posters or look at posters in the subway <laughs> or whatever right? yoni. well it's miru yoni narimashita yeah miru so yoni, miru yoni. i have come to be able to yeah miru, yeah I've, I've come to be able to look at the posters in the subway right? there was something about that miru yoni narimashita that that like i've come to be able to like the yoni especially that i was yeah. like it was almost like looking back and I was like, I'm, I'm in for it. This is going to be uh, a lot of work because if it's already <laughs> this different uh, and, right. and, and learning that the verbs yeah. always at the end too, was the first right. shock of many. Right. Right. Uh, did you have any kind of uh, reaction well, yeah, I, like that? Actually? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's a really interesting thing that you said. And um, my reaction to what you said is that is precisely what made it um, both interesting and um I think possible for me to study it. Actually, I always found that I'm amazed when I hear people like speak Spanish, for example. Like, how do they do that? <laughs> you know? And then I say, but Jeremy, it's fucking pretty much basically English if you <laughs> compare it to, you know, the yes. Japanese. Um, you're just like, um, but I think it was the alienness of the Japanese that pulled me into it and allowed me mm-hmm. to um it just made me really hungry to like explore what so what's going on when when they hear that no yoni like wow that's so interesting and then i would Mm -hmm. see other ways that yo is used oh yo can also be used this way no Mm -hmm. no yo uh you can say um you know (laughs) michael (laughs) so he looks he's got a face which is somewhat like wolverine right Mm -hmm. um and so i'd see well okay so these two different uses of yoni also yo is a thing that is like this and that's the and then 
you know, and then when you go further and you see other ways that yo is used and, and you just slowly start to expand that, um, your mm -hmm. sense of what Japanese is like from, uh, from a Japanese perspective. I think it, what I'm trying to say is that it's the fact that it had no connection to English that allowed mm -hmm. me to um, mm -hmm. not be confused. It was a completely separate uh, thing. Ah, I could see mm -hmm. that. Yeah. I could compartmentalize them, you know. Mm -hmm. Right. And have half of my brain go into there. But I think I would get really confused with Spanish. I would just be speaking English mm -hmm. with like an accent or something. But it's mm -hmm. it's it's also like know. you said, it, precisely because it's different. Like for example, forks are boring, chopsticks are interesting. You know this. Yeah. You know the different culture mm -hmm. plus right. different language structure itself. Right. right. Yeah. Draws you in more and more. Just yeah. even though that makes it harder and harder as well at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. It's like that. Do you? How long have you lived in Japan now? Um, I've been in Japan um, this time for, um, I guess, about 13 years. 13. Oh, okay. This time. Yeah. Well, you know, because there's been a lot of going, going, you know, I lived here. Um, I lived here uh, when I was in my, uh, what was that? So, when I was younger. Uh, I worked in here. <laughs> okay. um, <laughs> for a few years. And then I, I went back to the States for about 15 years before okay. i came back this time so there's been okay. a little going on yeah. did the states feel a lot different than when you left it when you came back that time at that time um no i'd only been in japan for like three years at that time so oh, okay. not really but but okay. I, I i don't think i could go back to the states now yeah that's that's fair it's, it's, it's really getting, different yeah it's now getting it's weird really now it's getting yeah, weird it's, i feel like it's, well, it's pretty fucking my first time to go to Japan was in 2001 and it was the summer of that year. Uh, I was on the jet program yeah. and I did just the one year while I was there at my like welcome party is when oh, the, I, the towers yeah. were yeah, attacked. Yeah, yeah. And, it just, and you're from the Bronx. And I, I was like, you know what? I, I'll, I'll go home. You know, I went back after the one year and it was, it was kind of a mistake because it wasn't there anymore. It was never the same. Yeah. No. It was just what I saw leaving in the summer of 2001 and coming back in the summer of 2002, I felt was unrecognizable. Yeah. 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 That was a, that's a really just, that must've been a very dislocating experience. Oof. It, was, because, it, it felt like I suddenly didn't belong quite anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> especially. Oh, wow. Yeah. Especially as a New Yorker, you, you got to understand, you know, yeah. it's different. It's, it was different for New Yorkers, but the whole country mm -hmm. went nuts. I was in Massachusetts yeah. at the time. Um, yeah i remember where i was um <laughs> but yeah <laughs> moving on to brighter subjects <laughs> <laughs> so when when did the uh when did it become clear to you what you might want to do with japanese was it during that college study was it later when when did these things really start to take shape for you never became clear didn't become clear <laughs> until i um uh, because I never wanted to do anything with it, you know, mm. I actually, mm. all I really wanted to do was, I think that all I really wanted to do was get out of my skin a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. you know, I was, I think, I think I was just trying to be a different person because I didn't, mm. I, I didn't know who this person was. So I thought, well, I'll just create something else, you know, and then I did that. And then, you know, so what do you want to do? I wanted to go to Japan. I wanted to speak to Japanese people. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be able to have a, a fluent conversation in a bar with 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 you know people regular people mm -hmm. and um and i didn't get to be that way and now i am that way so but mm -hmm. um yeah. so but yeah i mean i mean i guess when i was at when i was at konami and i was um i mean that was yeah that was probably that was it that was it that was it for sure i mean i was teaching english before that and yeah. um then when I got into Konami, I was like, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> you know? but that's, that's a hell of a different arena from yeah. teaching. Yeah. But it was a little disappointing because they had me locked up in a, a kind of a, a button down corporate culture when I wanted yeah. to, I wanted to be like having fun making games. Yeah. Mm. Which well, by the way, which by the way is not actually fun. I was going to say, I don't think yeah. you're the only one who was kind of locked down. In that, no, in I was going to say, make, 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 yeah, and, and making games, it, it ain't that fun anyway. Mm, just playing like, them is. Yeah. I think people have this weird thing where they, you know, 
they're like confusing like you know making games with playing games you know right yeah i'd imagine. much rather play than make anything <laughs> yeah you were never you said you were teaching english yeah for one year yeah. a jet no it was uh it was at a a kyla called eon oh yeah, they're, yeah they're that's still, still around, around right? right yeah they're still around we were in japan uh mike and i were in japan for the great fall of, of nova oh remember that? yeah nova oh. was uh no i, I didn't actually really i don't think. remember i don't remember I mean, I remember that they went down, but I don't remember what might have precipitated it. Nova had a rep. Nova was sort of the epitome of the Akaiwa that, mm-hmm. um, you know, they had they had a series of like um, talk about posters on chikatetsus, you know. Yeah, but, um, yeah, no, yeah, exactly. Nova, Nova always had these posters, uh, you know, the most handsome, like you know, yeah, like yeah, dudes they, they and definitely... like ladies, you know. It's big it, on it was, marketing. It was all. <laughs> so it was all about marketing. like. It was all about Japanese people wanting to talk to foreigners, you know. Mm. It was like right. it was essentially it was a cat cafe for. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I, I mean, it was if to for anybody listening that might not know, this was a English conversation school for adults that was in front of every station, and yeah. almost every town in Japan. Yeah, and Eon was sudden, too. Yeah. Eon yeah. was too. And then all of a sudden, I think in 2008 or so, right when we were living in Tokyo, it just, you know, crumbles. It goes, it goes away, it goes bankrupt. And I had heard that they were like, maybe even Yakuza affiliated. I don't know mm. about that, but who knows? They had some bad trading mm. that happened or mm. it was just like mm. they were this mm. huge mm. company and then just, just mm. gone. Mm. So, mm. 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 yeah, mm. yeah. Mm. Did you, um, play any games growing up you said you didn't though huh oh yeah oh no i played it I, I, I played the, the fuck out of games oh what hmm. games did you play growing up i was always a game player i mean i you know i went to the arcades in the 70s when i was a kid and um you know our first system was a you know it was like a what was that what was that called the um fuck it's 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 not uh coleco vision no, no, Air it was before Coleco. Television, dude. It was before Coleco Vision. It was it, Odyssey. It was, it was an it was an Odyssey. Yeah, we had an Odyssey. <laughs> okay, and it had it had pong and squash and uh, tennis or something. It's like, well, hey, then those are the same. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so we had an Odyssey, um, and then you know we had, uh, you know, of course we had Coleco Vision. We never got the Intellivision. My friend had an Intellivision. Mm-hmm. Then it was, you know. Uh, no, it was Atari first. It was Atari, then ColecoVision, you know. So Odyssey, Atari, ColecoVision, a couple different, yeah. you know, early PCs. Um, the arcade experience was really formative, you know. Okay. Like right, arcades yeah. were arcades were awesome in the seventies, in I the mean, late seventies and the eighties. They were so great. They were yeah. so great. Yeah. <laughs> so it was like the had like a, it like was known for having like the bad kids were drinking and smoking and stuff like that, no, that kind of era. Yeah. Well, you know. Yeah, I mean, New York in the '70s was was like that, but um, <laughs> that was anywhere. <laughs> yeah, no, hanging out at the mall, you know, it was like mm-hmm. that. But um, but I was going to say that um, at that time, playing games at home, it was like, you know, it was like the the poor man's replacement for the arcade. Yeah. You know, it was like mm-hmm. everything was trying to chase the arcade at that point. That's that's, that's how I felt about it all through the years growing up, even yeah. you know into the late '80s, where I was just like, "It's not as good as the arcade." I can't wait till my father takes me to Nathan's, you know. So, like, yeah. Mike, you're you're not that young, are you? <laughs> I am 42. Okay. I was I was born at the end of the '70s there, <laughs> so okay. I got it to grow up through the '80s mm. and and see the mm. beauty of the arcade, outclassing everything so yeah, so much so that it was just like painful to deal with. And this game, this show is named partly after Ninja Gaiden, which mm, mm, was mm, an mm, amazing mm. arcade game to me. It beat them yeah. up in like 88 or mm. so from, I think yeah. it was Tecmo. Yeah. And then I got the NES version and I was miserably disappointed because it was nothing mm. like the arcade. And I was just yeah. like, I want to go back and get a hot dog and play in the arcade. Yeah, so, yeah. same thing for, you know, so many games, Pac-Man and, yeah. you know. <laughs> Sorry. Actually, late, 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 Ladybug on the ColecoVision was the first game that I recall being a decent version of the arcade, Ladybug. Uh, okay. Ladybug. Check it out. I, I didn't oh. play Ladybug. That's yeah. Huh. Wasn't bad. 
<laughs> I yeah, grew up for playing. Me was, I mean, go ahead, Mike. Was, sorry. It, I was gonna say it was definitely like once the 16-bit generation hit is where I was like, oh, thank God. <laughs> yeah, but one thing. So, yeah. um, no, I'm sorry. Um, I was just gonna say continuing uh, on, uh, you know, Atari, and then uh, you know, um, Super Nintendo, uh, Nintendo, then Super Nintendo. Um, <laughs> But the amazing thing when I think about it now is that, um, I mean, I was like, I was in college playing, I was, I was, I was in college when, you know, playing Super Nintendo. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And now it's like, I mean, kids are playing games from the time that they're able to play games. And yeah, um, it's amazing, you know. Yeah, it's I mean, part I, of the culture now. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not necessarily even, a subculture. <laughs> it, that's right. Even the word uh, gamer doesn't make sense anymore. Mm -hmm. Oh, right. Because like, there's no separation. Right. I think so. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Everybody's a gamer. Yeah, pretty much. So you go from teaching English at a Eon mm -hmm. to Konami. How did this happen? Mm. Uh, I got fired at uh, <laughs> Eon for, for, being, for being a shitty English teacher. Okay. Well, actually, I, I didn't get picked up again. I was a I was a cat in the cat cafe who <laughs> like pretended to be a human or something like that. <laughs> you know? No, I would, I would speak Japanese in my, uh, in my classrooms and um, yeah, I'd try to explain oh. grammatical. Yeah. You know, I was actually trying to teach English as opposed to right. like, you know, just that being. Doesn't quite fit their business model. It didn't fit the business model. Yeah. <laughs> I was told not to speak Japanese as well when yeah. I was uh, teaching there. It's yeah. just it's weird how that happens, but uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. so you just you just basically so get I, fired and you apply for the job. I I get I I do not get picked up for the next year, and uh, mm -hmm. I um, am desperate to stay in Japan as I always am. And my brother, my twin brother, is working at Chicago uh, Konami in Chicago. Oh, oh okay okay wow that's an yeah. interesting connection. <laughs> well, it was interesting. I actually started. Um, after college, I got a job. Uh, it was grad school. It was after. God, it was after grad school. I guess I got a I got a job at um, Jalico in Chicago. Oh, okay. Jalico, remember Jalico Game Company? Yeah, base loaded or was it base is loaded? Yeah, you got it. Loaded. Base is loaded. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> very good. Um, and uh, I worked there for a short time. And while I was there, I helped my twin brother get in there. So we were both working at Jalico. Uh, okay i lost that job similarly through a kind of insubordination <laughs> uh bad cat bad cat behavior and, uh, okay and then i uh, yeah and then so anyway so there i was in in japan lost my job uh, teaching english my twin brother he helped me get an interview in tokyo and okay. i just you know he talked to a japanese guy can you can my brother do an interview so i went to tokyo yeah. did an interview um and uh got stuff so okay mm. that's cool so that takes us into uh, the big show yeah it was the big... translation yeah. right yeah okay yeah. so can you tell us a little bit about this i noticed on the the site <clears throat> uh dragon baby you have mention mm. of the term trans creation there so mm. i was wondering if you could talk about these terms localization translation mm. trans creation how you see them how you see yeah. if there are any differences to you or, yeah. um i i don't see a difference you know, I don't see a difference, but I, but I think that, you know, there's an enormous problem in, in getting people to understand the mm -hmm. things that we're trying to do. And in fact, there's differences in opinion about what we should be doing. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of it stems from the fact that, um, well, so many people are enamored of Japanese culture now. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, ex the extreme voice you hear on, on the one side, the ones that are, um, that kind of come off as uh, extreme in the sense of um, this is where we get into the confusion between translation and localization. You know, mm -hmm. if you look on, on the Twitter verse, which I don't really encourage, but if you do, um, you'll see a lot of um, subculturally uh, invested people um, mm -hmm. clamoring about how we shouldn't localize, you know, kill the localizers, we need more translators or that kind of thing. I don't know if you guys have ever seen this kind of thing. But... Yeah, there's definitely been some very uh, misguided <laughs> sentiments out there. Yeah. And it's doing the research for this podcast and reaching out to people and becoming more a part of translation Twitter, 
Mm, I've mm, mm. become aware of uh, some of these uh, controversies, if you want to call mm. them, within yeah. the community. Yeah. Well, how do you see them? I mean, obviously, my opinion tends to be. I mean, I have a strong opinion on the subject. I'm I'm my, kind of curious what a what a what a reasonable opinion on the subject would be like. My, you know? my stance is very simple. It's if you if you're at a position where you can complain about the work that was done in a translation or localization, you don't like what it was done, then that means you know enough of that original language to enjoy mm. the art in its original mm. language and you oh, have no a... reason to go bothering anyone. Mm. Yeah, I I think that people don't realize just quite how different Japanese is. And they think that mm -hmm. you're taking right. too much of uh, creative license with the translation um, because you do have you have to get creative at times. Uh, and right. um, it, but people don't realize just how just how creative you do have to be at times. It's just just because just how different the languages are. And a lot of people don't realize that. And then they'll lash out because it, it seems like, and again, I'm sort of new to this. I mean, I've, I'm not new to video games and liking right. Japan, but I'm new to translation Twitter. And right. it seems like these people, some of these people um, will do a Google translate and see like, right. well, why isn't it like this? And it's like, right. well, right. That's, right. you know, it's right. what are you talking about? Right. And then the other weird thing about it is that, um, it's a little bit hard to put into words, but I would say it this way. People that are otaku or whatever, you know, word you mm -hmm. want to use, big fans of uh, big, big fans of that. Um, what they're into is the fact that it's exotic. Mm -hmm. They're into it because it's exotic and they want it to <clears throat> sound Japanese, if you will. Mm -hmm. And for them, sounding Japanese sounds like may maybe, maybe I'm just kind of half speculating, but... Um, they want it to sound like broken English so that they think that it's closer to being Japanese. Does that make mm. sense? Right. It's putting J Japanese people in a box in a sense as well. I can, I can see that. You know, so. But, yeah. Well, localization generally tends to make those barriers disappear. They want that. Mm -hmm. They want the exactly. sense of other in their art. It, exactly. I can, I can exactly. also that, see, like, if you remember in the 90s, like, not to discredit anybody like voice acting work, but some of the voice acting work wasn't the best, but then people started to prefer that. And I do think this is related to what you're saying. I think some people, some people probably think this way of voice acting is how Japanese people really talk. Like that's, you know, it's hard to explain, but like this type of, this type of inflection in English they're just copying the way Japanese people talk, but it's just like, probably not. That's just because that they didn't have the money to get super great actors in the nineties <laughs> and before, you know, <laughs> get the best actors at least. Oh. Yes. I don't, I, I, I don't know if that's the same subject, but that is definitely a subject I could talk about, but, okay. Uh, and I know, and I, and I, I think I know what game you're talking about too, but <laughs> And part of the reason we're looking to one of the reasons I wanted to get into this translation uh, as a common topic for our guests mm -hmm. on the show yeah. is also to like to help get this information out there to have people um, understand yeah. it better because I would I really, really like to yeah. very unjust how yeah. much uh, people are being attacked I, and speaking yeah. as someone who works in a field that is constantly under criticism I'm, I'm a teacher uh, I was mm -hmm. an ESL mm -hmm. teacher for 15 mm -hmm. years mm -hmm. you know constantly being told I'm doing my job wrong. I don't know how to do it. Meanwhile, yeah. you can see I've got quite a few students who are speaking English very comfortably at this point. Mm, mm, mm. Everybody thinks they're an expert. Right. Um, and yeah, I mean, so this is a really, this is really, in a way, this is the only subject <laughs> for, for a translator. I mean, what we're trying, it's a question of what you're trying to do. You know, mm -hmm. are you trying to, um, there, there's so many things that a translator has to balance. Let me let me just give you an example. Um, mm -hmm. We've got the audience that we want to satisfy, right? We want them to have a, an experience. No. What kind of experience do we want them to have? Well, the idea is to give them the same experience that was in the original. Does that sound like a good goal? Yes, absolutely. Uh, but I could say, um, no, no. Your job as a translator is not to is not to. Very often, the other side, you know, don't they don't want don't change anything is what they say. 
don't change anything, don't change it. Forgetting about the fact that the process of translating is, of course, changing everything. We're changing yeah. the fucking language. We're changing the, <laughs> <laughs> we're changing. The only way that you can understand it is through language. The only way your brain can understand it. So please understand that we can't not change it. Mm -hmm. And everything that is Western culture is embodied in our language and structured by a language and the way that we think and perceive the world you can't even you can't even think about how you uh you can't even think about anything without language and so <laughs> even your thought processes are completely you know based upon your language and so of course we've changing it but mm -hmm. towards what end you know are we um trying to preserve the alienness so that you can feel like you're playing in Japanese, even though it's in English. So mm. we have all all the characters speak like, um, yes, I, you know, like Tarzan or something like that. Mm -hmm. So that they'll feel like they're speaking broken English in your English language. It, it gets so complicated. So Which, anyway. you know, for, for quite a few years, you know, in movies and such, that was the way. But I'm only on the first, the first, the first, you know, uh, so who we're trying to please, the audience, we got mm. the audience, right? We got to, right? Please, the audience, we have to be um, faithful and do justice and be respectful of the original work. Mm -hmm. But what right. is that? What is the original work? Is the original work the words? Is it the author's intent? Hmm. Right? Is it the, the um, so where where is the locus of that work? If it's a horror movie, right? You know, if, if you're watching a horror movie, obviously, um, we haven't done the author's work unless we've scared you or something like this, mm -hmm. right? So our job then is to do what the author did, which is to reach into your you know, soul and scare you, right? Which is not the same thing if it's a, a, a love story or something else or, well, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say, so in the second case, we're trying to be respectful of the author's intent. Mm -hmm. In the third case, we've got the actual words sitting there on the page. Let's forget about the author. There are words there that need to be translated. And your job is to translate what these words are, which is the, the extreme position. Mm -hmm. Just translate the words, just do your job, mm -hmm. right? Um, so you go to the dictionary and you, 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 know, you put those words in there and you say, no yo ni means, you know, <laughs> but that's not the way we speak. I would, I would never say, um, I have, uh, you know, I have become able to, what, <laughs> right. what was that? I've become able to I see, see posters, posters in, the, in the subway. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> so what are you trying to say? You know? <laughs> um, right. And uh, so what? Author, so author, the, and then you've got, and then you've got uh, beyond the author, beyond the words, beyond the audience. Um, if it's games, you've got, uh, you've got to be, fun entertaining you've got to make money you've got to um but then there's the just the the, the level of the um i think that i think there's a thing that exists um and i'll call it the the, the world of the idea you know mm -hmm. I, i'm just kind of working on some fly but when an, when when a when a create a creator comes up with something there's mm -hmm. an idea there's an idea there right and that idea exists in that creator's language because that's how he's perceiving the world. That's how he's thinking about things. Mm -hmm. But but behind that language, there's something, right? Mm -hmm. It's right. it's not the language. Yeah. It's the idea that the guy had. It mm -hmm. happens to be in his own language, but he's got a, a concept. He's got a feeling and he's grabbing onto that feeling and he's describing it through a series of um, codes that is his language. And it's the only way he can get it out of his his soul and he's, he can describe it to his uh, fellow people who speak his language and they more or less get exactly what he's talking about because they grew up with the same code system with the same mm -hmm. references the same they watch the same tv programs they listen to the same politicians they ate the same food they know exactly what this dude's trying to get at but mm -hmm. what he's trying to get at is an idea he's not trying to, it's not those it's not in those words exactly it's in it's in the idea and then the method that he um, conveys that idea is through his language and the limitations of his language. Mm -hmm. I speak Japanese. I listen to it. I get it. Oh, that's my Japanese sort of brain. And I get it. Mm -hmm. I get what he's going for. 
but then when I switch, it's it's like Mike switching to his uh, his Bronx accent, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. When I switch back to uh, the English, yeah. it's code switching, you know. And when I switch mm. back to English, like I'm trying to explain to my people what that idea is, not what those words are exactly, but what those Japanese people are talking about and feeling. And I have to take all those references and all those feelings associated with those culture bound ideas. And I now have to switch them to a different culture and try to get the same thing. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So if a, if a Japanese person says in Japanese, um, I love the feeling of coming home and it makes me think of miso soup. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Do I, I, or no, he doesn't say that. He just says, ah, miso soup, right? <laughs> Imagine the character just says, ah, miso soup, right? And mm. what, what, what he's really saying is, ah, home, you know? Mm. Now, how, do right. I, how do I communicate that to, uh, to someone who yeah. doesn't know what miso soup is, you know? Right. I might, I might say, ah, borscht, or, you know, ah, chicken soup, you know? Mm-hmm. But okay. have I... Have I done a disservice by changing something or have I done a service by communicating something? Hmm. This is the this is just a, a simplified example of everything that you know we right. we struggle with and, and why there's hmm. disagreements about what is a good translation. Some hmm. people want to know about Japanese culture. Teach me about Japanese culture, keep it as miso soup. Well, hmm. I understand that you want to learn about Japanese culture, hmm. but it's my job to be a a teacher of Japanese culture or to preserve the intent and the feeling. So mm-hmm. these are debatable issues. That's why this is a creative endeavor and a yeah. an artistic endeavor and not a and not a science. So there's no right or wrong. There are choices. And um yeah, no matter what you make in art, you can't have everyone be happy. <laughs> yeah. just... mm. Is this a relatively recent thing that you have all this backlash with translation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's um, it's right in line with uh, other things that are happening on the the internet. Um, yeah, all this access that people have to, you know, it's like people clapping back at Trump. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. well, you feel like you know you have a relationship with Trump now. Okay, you know, mm-hmm. because <laughs> you, know, you got. 50,000 followers. So now you can clap back at a dude who's got whatever, 10 million followers. And mm-hmm. um, it's just yeah. a weird, you know, it's just a weird time to be like when I translated um, in my early career, I didn't think people were going to be comparing the Japanese and the English. Mm-hmm. I was just trying to, you know, I mean, you've got country, um, co- you know, region locks, right? Yeah. Yeah. And you didn't have the internet. And so people that were playing one game in Europe weren't going to be playing the Japanese version. It was the European version. And it was just supposed to be an isolated, you know. Right, right. Game yeah. that was entertaining <laughs> and fun. And um, it didn't really matter. You weren't going to have people Google translating and combing over your translation. For... <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. yeah. No, it was just that you got to make the it product was... for the people and just... enjoy it. And that's that. But, just trying to make a product, yeah. yeah. Very different now. Yeah. Hmm. I think we, we covered some of those other questions that I had that were follow-up to that. Oh, so, and, yeah, by the way, I would also add, you know, that I, given that change, I probably would translate. Um, I would make different choices these days. Mm-hmm. You, you would have for some of your stuff in the past? I, yeah, some of my stuff, I, I think so, for sure. You know, I mean, I can't I mean, imagine anyone looking back on the art that they've made through the years and not having oh, some <laughs> point where they're going to second right, guess sure. something. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, oh, exactly. Yeah. You know? yeah. Exactly. And you know, the other thing I would I would just add is that when you're translating, you only have one moment to make that decision, and usually it's you know like under quite a lot of time pressure. Mm-hmm. So you're, you're you're translating a line, you translate it, you go to the next line. You don't you know. You may look back over your stuff, but you don't really have very much time. You certainly don't have the the, the luxury of hundreds of hours of, <clears throat> yeah, you know, time like people have now. Um, right. so, so, yeah, you know, you translate it and you move on. And um, obviously that also leads to mistakes and imperfections and stylistic, stylistic choices that 
it, it's just I, I guess I I want people to understand that um, you know if you're if you're one of the people out there dissecting translations, mm -hmm. you're probably spending ten or a hundred times more time doing that line that you're criticizing than any of us ever had in our best, mm -hmm. you know, in our in our in our even in our most leisurely times <laughs> you know mm -hmm. yeah so it's it's definitely a a big shift in the culture with uh, <clears throat> constant scrutiny for so many things and of course you know this is just one example one particular scene but there's so many that e go every, all over. everything everything yeah right. so i had a i had a question about <clears throat> um this obviously is related to um, how art affects people. Um, mm. I'm curious about this. You've worked on some pretty heavy games in the past. You, you mm. worked on Silent Hill. Um, yeah. And this is so like Silent Hill 2 <clears throat> is a game that I, I was, it was the first game that I actually enjoyed on my PlayStation 2. I had the PlayStation mm. 2 since launch and it really, I, I felt like I was nothing there was, I was finding nothing on it, but once that wow. game hit, it was the, really the wow. mark for me. We're like, oh, I'm going to put my Dreamcast aside for a little while. I'm, I'm, I'm going to play this, you know? Mm. And uh, the thing is, I've only played through it, I think, once and then half a time, but it's still with me. This is 20 years later. Was it enjoyable? It was. It was a fantastic mm -hmm. experience, mm -hmm. and, I, and I, felt, I felt sort of the uh, constant pressure of being in that silent hill mm. and and, and sort of the unknowing that that was constantly there is like what is happening i don't fully understand and i really enjoy that because i had always been like a twin peaks fan and all okay but, but the thing is like i think about how this is 20 years later and i could still feel some of that emotion <clears throat> that i had sitting <clears throat> on my couch in <clears throat> japan <clears throat> as my friend <clears throat> had sent the copy from america for me oh <clears throat> and so i think you had a uh, you had a, you had a, you had an American, uh, or I mean, you had an English. Oh, I, have, uh, I had brought my U.S. PlayStation but, to yeah, Japan, and then eventually yeah. I bought a Japanese PlayStation Two yeah. as well because I was okay. like, "Oh, I want to play Parappa Two <laughs> and all this okay, stuff." Okay, okay. <laughs> but, uh, but the thing is, like, I think about how deeply that game has affected me, and and that I've only played through it really in completion once, and it stayed yeah. with me. And I and I kind of took a took a step back and said, "You know what? I want to leave that." I want to leave those yeah. foggy memories, but I want to hold on to those feelings. And nice, I wonder foggy. I like that. Do you hear that? Do you hear how Mike did that? Everybody, he put <laughs> foggy. foggy into that. That was good. I do what <laughs> I can. <Very> <laughs> But I think about how deeply it affected me, and I know that you're working on these 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 games, these works of art that are just so deeply emotionally effective. And how how does it how does it affect you day to day? How do you break away mm. from that? And I and I know recently I saw Dragon Baby working <clears throat> on Heat Streamer Overload, mm, and mm, I mm. looked into that game and I was like, I do not think I can emotionally handle that game. I cannot I didn't translate that. like to work on it. So you, oh, it's your company, but somebody else on your team. <laughs> yeah, uh, a translator named Mimi worked on that, and, okay. and um, they did such an amazing job. Okay. And it was because they, they completely got into it. I mean, you can't, yeah. uh, you cannot do a good job on something. If you're a translator, your job is to uh, kind of do this deep dive into the psyche of the author. Mm -hmm. That that's how I always felt, you know. Yeah. Like you have to get into the mindset of the author. Right. And then you do that, and then you do that code switch thing, and then you do this kind of uh, crossword puzzle thing where you're um, trying to find the right phrase that feels like the phrase in Japanese. And it feels, mm. I mean, it always felt kind of crosswordy. It's the way your brain kind of, mm. right? Um, and so for how a real. Uh, when you go ahead and you put yourself deeply into the psyche of that author, right? Then you feel. <laughs> Yeah, then you feel what that what you either to write first of all to write a line that is filled with emotion, you have mm -hmm. to experience that emotion yourself as in the same way that an act. This is how it is for me. Okay, I'm only describing my my experience, but that's, that's um, all I would ask you to answer for. <laughs> yeah. So for the for the emotional lines, whether it be a sad emotion or an angry emotion or a sexy emotion, mm -hmm. um, you have to feel it, and I suspect that that's what all writers are doing. Mm -hmm. Because you can't write a line that sounds natural unless you uh, 
um, you have to sort of become an actor to, mm. you're, you're using your instrument, which is language, like mm. an, inst- uh, an actor uses their instrument, which is their language and their, you know, their face and their, but they're going into their own um, emotional experiences and background and trying mm. to feel something. And if you're not feeling something, um, or if you're not, um, it's not always emotion. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's, um, well, let me, let me just go back to what I was saying. Um, so yeah, you have to, you have to experience the emotion of that scene mm-hmm. and not just for the, the, the dialogue, but, um, for the prose as well, because you have mm-hmm. to paint, paint that feeling. What is the author? What feeling is the author trying to, to do here? Mm-hmm. But I do get I do get emotionally affected by the scenes I translate. You know, yeah. um, it's pretty intense. I'll, I'll tell you. Um, so how do you handle that? How do you give yourself a break from it when when you have to close up shop for the day, so to speak? I don't know, man. It's hard sometimes. My my wife died in April, and oh, um, I'm yeah. sorry. Mm-hmm. Condolences. Thanks. Um, and uh, it was. Uh, um, <clears throat> there were some um, similarities to some of the stuff in Silent Hill 2 actually with that um, and I wrote all those lines you know that James said about his dying wife you know and, mm-hmm. and, and so to re-experience that 30 years 20 years later uh, was uh, pretty it was I, I couldn't get it out of my mind actually but um, but yeah, um, when I, I translate some gay, <laughs> you get horny. I translate <laughs> sad scenes, you get sad. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But yeah, yeah, it's it's just it's like a you know it's it's something that I've only really recently been thinking about was how you know when you are the writer, the original creator, you know you're you're trying to communicate what's in your own mind. But when you have to mm. get into someone else's mind, and sometimes you kind of feel that like. <clears throat> sure if i really want to be here right now (laughs) yeah 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 that's true that's true but i think that all human beings have the same you know Mm -hmm. we all have the same emotions you know with just different amounts and everybody's able to access every other person i think Mm -hmm. yeah it's just you know we all make those decisions about what art we engage with and you know something like needy streamer overload i I look at Mm. that like i think that this looks amazingly well crafted but i don't think that i can emotionally handle it i couldn't i couldn't have accessed it either i don't you know first of all in terms of the culture i I don't know the culture Mm -hmm. um and so i couldn't have approached it and Mm -hmm. so we found a translator who could yeah and that's why it was a really really great translation i mean the reviews were fantastic (laughs) of that translation yeah, um, there's so much, so much language. It just feels so dense and so it's just like and I it, watched and the it, first ten minutes and I was like, yeah. oh wow. <laughs> and it's a, it's such a particular type of language, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was kind of blown away by that. Um, but I think you know, translators can do amazing work. It's mm-hmm. it's such a it's such a great field, and um, I think we should be encouraged to do our best and um there are a lot of things there are a lot of obstacles that um that are in our way that prevent us from i think doing our best um some of it's the like we were talking about before the pressure from um all these different sides whether it's the fans or it's the the original authors who don't quite get the idea of translation why did you change my words Mm -hmm. fans why did you change the words um and then there's the software um, that we use that keeps your glossaries. Why'd you change the words? Yeah. Right. <laughs> last, last time you used this word for this word. Why'd you use this word for this word? You know, here's a reminder. Ding, ding, ding. Mm. And, and then there's the fact that, you know, if you're, if you're on autopilot translating, you're not mm. going to do a good translation. You're going to, you're just going to do the word by word translation I have become able to see the posters <laughs> on the subway. You know? Yes, exactly. Right. <laughs> yeah. And uh, who wants to read that? You know. Um, so there's a lot of, it, and, and so it's so much easier to just say, like, I don't have to think about it. That's, mm-hmm. you know, chikate tsunami post yomi yoni You know, I just translated there. I'm done. Okay, that's 
how many, how many emoji is that? Okay. I just earned 25 cents, you know? Um, <laughs> mm. And I don't want to go back because I, you know, the financial pressures, I mean, it's not, the more mm-hmm. time I spend on it, the better it gets, but the, the less money I earn. Mm-hmm. So all, all these, all these things, all these obstacles to doing a good job. And it's true in every profession, mm-hmm. the time you spend, it's not good for you economically to, <laughs> to do mm-hmm. a good job on anything. Yeah. So what is it that makes you do a good job? If you're, <laughs> if you're making burgers, you want to make people enjoy your burgers, you know? Hey, it reminds me of the time I used to work uh, custodial sometimes in the summers when I would come home from college and uh, I got put in a school mm-hmm. and the, I, I had to do a painting in this room or whatever. And the guy was mm-hmm. watching me paint and he goes, Mike, you're not painting your house, man. Just just swap it on there and move to the next. <laughs> <one."> <laughs> it's like we're just going to have to paint it again next year anyway. <laughs> yeah, right. So and it's the same thing, by the way, with. Uh, voice direction too when you're directing mm. voice actors mm. voice actors you put them in the studio they're just going to read what's in front of them because they got to get uh, what 30 lines uh 30 lines an hour 40 lines an hour mm. maybe 60 lines an hour you know oh. if they you know mm-hmm. if they're whipping through it and that means that you're reading the thing and you're just you know <laughs> hey wh- hey what do you mean you, there was a murder here you know oh okay where's the gun you know and they just go through it and you as a director, you got it. These are lines from different scenes, too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because one actor's doing them one at a time. <laughs> yeah, that was really funny. What do you mean she's dead? You know, that kind of thing. It's like, as you're listening to this as a director, and you got to remember what each scene was. Oh, no, 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 no. He mm-hmm. said that. I was supposed to be sarcastic. He's dead? Not he's dead, but he's dead. Mm. And so. Right. So then if you don't stop that actor and then when you st- <laughs> and then when you stop that actor, that's studio time, man. You're costing the clients money. You know, mm-hmm. our you just blew our schedule. You just blew our schedule. We you know, now we're gonna have to you know add another half day or, or something like this. No oh, man, it's yeah. very hard. And when and when fans, you know, discuss this on Twitter or whatever, they don't mm-hmm. fucking know how much <laughs> yeah, how hard it was. So getting any art done is a hard process and and you never get done what you started what you intended you always wind up with some weird mixture of the mistakes plus the good things plus the you know (laughs) no it's like jackson pollock man he didn't fucking know what he was doing (laughs) (laughs) no one does mike you you had your metal gear questions answered through everything else Uh, you had you had some metal gear stuff you wanted to no, no, we're good. We're, you already covered it? Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, cool. Well, moving on. <laughs> okay, so um, mine's definitely not as heavy as what uh, you guys are talking about with Silent Hill and everything. Um, <laughs> but good. You're, I, I, don't, I don't have the exact good. line in front of me. Yeah, I don't have the exact line in front of me, but, you know, what is a man, a miserable pile of secrets yeah. from Castlevania? Did you have any idea the kind of cultural no. impact that would have? That was just a throwaway line at the time. Of course not. No. No, that's <laughs> it was, no. It was. It was not a throwaway line. I was, was going to say that. It was, no, it was in the it was in the beginning, though, right? Yeah. It was, so. No, that was that was an example of what I said before about actually taking a lot of time to try to be impactful. That mm-hmm. was, you know, um, so this fits into the category of one things that I probably would do differently today. Really? Well, yeah, because you know, I don't, I don't, you know, I'm not trying to gather attention on on myself. Um, and, uh, now there's just too many people that would say, why'd you change that line? But at the time, my only thought was, I love this game. This is an exciting scene. I want to be in a weird way. I was, so let's assume that when you transit something, it's going to be, it's going to change. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so in a weird way, I felt like I was more accurate it's not going to make any sense what I'm about to say, but in, in the mind frame I was in, I was trying to be more in tempo with the game Mm -hmm. and create more of the game experience than what you would have felt if I had translated what was in the original. Mm -hmm. Does that make any sense? Not really, but it does to me. Yeah. It's how I, I, it's how I felt, you know, it's like, it was just a line that I couldn't figure out any way to make. It was like, here's Dracula throwing down his glass. Right. 
and the line's something like, you know, we shall see uh, through death which of the, the one is speaking the truth. You know, it's like, I think that was the line, something like that. Okay. Yeah. And uh, it just felt like, well, yeah, that was a throwaway line. It, I couldn't make it not a throwaway line, and yet it was supposed to be an impactful line. And I didn't want a throwaway line where there was supposed to be an impactful line. Mm -hmm. um, it was such a good opportunity visually, you know, with Dracula throwing down the glass. So I said, no, I need, you know, I need something with this tempo to match the bam, you know, and he says something. Right. What is a man, you know, or. And so I looked and I looked and I looked and I spent, you know, probably way too much time going through like <laughs> books of proverbs and stuff like this. And I found oh, a wow. super, super obscure line. And uh, I'd never heard of that guy. And I'd never heard of that that quote, but I, I what did what did I look up? What did I? I can't even remember how I looked it up. Maybe I looked up proverbs with you know man or proverbs with. You know. Anyway, somehow I stumbled across this in a weird way that the internet will give you weird things, and that was just what I seized upon. And um, and then and then the the uh, the accidental thing of it was um, the let's just say that the voice direction and the voice acting uh was uh, a bit unusual as was the <laughs> as was the sound mix <laughs> so yeah that's, that's definitely an interesting aspect of it because like if i if i imagined okay we didn't have voice at this time and i was just reading the text i i feel that okay i i i like this writing i feel this is strong i enjoy this thank the you writing, and you know yeah. the writing oh, yeah. incredible like that b quality uh campiness that actually I think is what made it last all this time Definitely. Even more than the writing, because that's, this is something that has come up in our other conversations regarding say like the Shenmue voice acting where, you know, there's all this triple A work, but there's also a little bit of the off kilter voice acting that makes it really just work for me in a way that's so different. Like I hold on to that more than the writing itself. Mm. And I think that the, the the voice acting for this scene with Dracula and Richter would have been very different to say like the current what is it uh, Richard well, if you Arnold had like Troy doing it <laughs> yeah if you had like Troy Baker like doing it like too yeah. perfectly yeah um, yeah so it was campy I guess is what you were saying I don't <laughs> I don't something. think I was aware just how I love the you made it I didn't know that it was a lot of license taken there that's that's interesting oh you didn't know that that line was uh... I've oh, never was... played it in Japanese, uh, I don't think. Oh yeah, I and so the new version they actually they put they they retranslated and took out uh, what is a man. That that takes out the punch. I think it was the right decision. Did you have like B horror movies in mind? Uh, uh when, no. when doing mm -hmm. that? Okay. No. You're just trying to find something with some punch. Yeah. No. Okay. But yeah, so that's the thing I'm saying. Like it didn't the writing didn't feel B grade. The writing didn't feel. Good. Yeah, I, I think that you know the actor, the it's actors quality. didn't. And I was trying to write. Um, I wrote some of that in an archaic style. You know, mm -hmm. okay. I think and it I, worked. I absolutely think it worked. I thought I've it was always been. Kid. I thought it made Dracula seem different from what the original said. Right, in, in right, right. Ways. right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that I think you localized it successfully. That's my opinion of it. <laughs> that's very. That's. I think that's, so too. That's very nice to hear. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 a one of the best games of all time, but b one of the most iconic scenes in gaming of all time, I think, uh, especially in English. So yeah, it's, it's just so I it, it's it's a bit weird to hear that it was a a great localization, but the fact that people love it because it sounds so bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like that. I wouldn't say bad. It's just people love cheesiness. People love that's it. That's true. You yeah. know what I mean? And it's that well, it's yeah, just that perfect saying, kind of cheese. Well, it's kind of so the well. difference. It's like the difference between la you know, someone laughing at your joke or laughing at you mm -hmm. making your joke, you know. But but again, I didn't I didn't direct it and it was um mm -hmm. uh I had nothing to do with the casting. When it came out, I was like, yeah, yeah, you know. Like the guy's like, What do you hear? And I'd have people say, Oh, it's a grammatical mistake. I'm like, oh no, it's actually not a grammatical mistake. It's a, you know, I was over influenced by Thor comics in the, in the, in the <laughs> right, right, right. You know? 
Okay. This is what you brought up with you know doing the research for this line and how you would do it differently uh, now because obviously time is of the mm. essence. I, I really was struck by that. You wrote a, an opinion piece for uh, Polygon a couple of years back that explored the Metal Gear Solid situation mm. and everything. Mm. You, you mentioned something about this. And I really was struck by how much research and work you were putting into the translation of Metal Gear Solid and mm. see like, you know, Castlevania had very few lines really compared to something like that. Right, yeah. Still this effort put into it. I was... Mm. I was really amazed to see that. And I was thinking like, man, that cannot be easy for someone to deal with, to put all that in. <laughs> it has to be fun for you. You have to be, enjoy it. You know, and I, mm -hmm. I, yeah. All right. Uh, well, uh, awesome scene. One of the best, one of my favorites of all time. So thank you for that. So good. Hey. <laughs> um, uh, do you think that we'll ever, this is like, kind of my idea i guess but do you think we'll ever see snatcher release from mobile and games like that it just seems so perfectly placed for a touch screen you know yeah i don't think so um although i don't know why i mean snatcher is absolutely one of my favorite games yeah. okay i was so blown away when i when i played that <clears throat> um and uh yeah, it kind of kills me. <laughs> I mean, and you know, and the sales were so bad. Sales were so horrendously bad. Okay. Of of Snatcher, that I think that maybe people don't understand that <clears throat> it wasn't the game. It was uh, it was entirely due to the uh, the fact that nobody actually owned a Sega CD. I was gonna say, what <laughs> was the installed user base for Sega CD? <laughs> it was terrible. It was, I it was actually, ter I had one, but I didn't, I didn't buy Snatcher. <laughs> I wasn't even aware of it until oh, later on, actually. What? Yeah, what? I know, wow. I know. The fuck? I know. Wow. <laughs> I'm bad. There was like, but how many games were there for that Sega CD? That, He's busy that playing. You? I had Sewer <laughs> I did, it came with Sewer Shark. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um... So, Sonic CD, yeah. that was the one. Anyway, moving on. I don't know. I and I also don't. I don't know the issues with the copyrights and and Konami is such a weird, you know, They've animal. Definitely... Anyway, who knows what those guys are thinking? Yeah. So this, I, I noticed. I I had um, remembered seeing when I was in Japan the um, Kamai Tachi no Yoru uh, mm -hmm. series, and yeah. I it's only recently that I saw that you had worked on a translation for that for mobile, and I went to go buy it. And it's not there anymore. Hey, man, don't talk to me. Talk you know, to, uh, but talk it's just to those guys. These things, like, it feels like it shouldn't be something that just disappears like that, you know? Yeah. Wow. It's sad, man. It's so sad. And I put in a lot of, um, I, I probably, I mean, I really put a lot of work into that translation. And um, certain fans will, would kill would kill me for it because I, completely localized it like <laughs> i moved it from being set in japan to being set in canada mm -hmm. because the only reason it was set in japan it was a murder mystery mm -hmm. and it wasn't set in japan so that a certain group of people could like learn what miso soup is or you know <laughs> right <laughs> it was there because the writers were japanese and that was what they knew um and so they're and they're writing for their fandom which are japanese people and they knew that that was what they knew. And so it would make them feel a certain way. And so, yeah, I localized it. Yes. Um, I had complete control. I loved the process of writing it. I, I, I worked really hard to do great writing. I think I did great writing. And um, I was so disappointed with the way that uh, a certain company, you can look it up. Mm -hmm. um, actually, we were, I, I was, we were, I was negotiating with uh, my, uh, my friend and partner at the time to get the rights to release that and publish it uh, through a company we had formed. Um, yeah, but just, we, 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 we lost out, we lost out in the bid and, and um, the company, uh, what was it? It was a company, the Zero Escape. Um, I can't remember mm -hmm. the name. Um, S, uh, Spike. Oh. No, no, not Spike. They're the ones who did the original. Oh. It was um, uh, the company that does 999 and, you know. Um, I thought that was Spike. Well, no, 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 no. That's um, the the somebody look it up, but um, I, I know it begins with an A. Uh, it's um, 
Atlas? No, not Atlas. No. <laughs> Dude, come on, guys. Atlas come on. Sega, right? Yeah, I can't. Yeah, but I can't remember. I, I know uh, they recently released those games, 999, uh, Virtus Last it was, or whatever. Of course, it was, it, was, it was developed by Chinsoft, but it was released by... Um, Hmm. Um, oh, Axis, yeah, Axis Games. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Axis Games. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we we translated it for Spike Chunsoft, and then Axis Game picked up the rights to it, and mm -hmm. they bought the translation out wholesale. Whereas Axis normally does their own localization in house. Oh. Um, and uh, they really didn't advertise for the game. Mm -hmm. they really they promised to put it out on uh on android and they never did that mm. so nobody fucking played it oh man and it's... i it was like translating a novel you know yeah it was it, it was it's straight text that thing yeah it's all text i never translated so much um uh so much dialogue and prose before so completely mm. I feel like it, it is a problem with just video games as as an art yeah. and entertainment medium that there's not a strong sense of archiving materials, making them yeah. available, you know, as, as hardware moves forward. Mm. And the thing is, iOS, it's on iOS. Like, I should still be able to access that easily. Yeah, enough. yeah, it's something, isn't it? It's, you know, yeah. I've still got all the text somewhere. Maybe I'll just, you know, <laughs> release it. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Yeah. Well, come to think of it, you know, can you tell us a little bit about your actual process? What it looks like when you sit down and you're you're going to do your translation localization work? What how do you set your office up? What programs are you using? How do you nah, communicate it's... with the the uh, companies? Well, it's different project by project, you know. Okay. And it's different, you know, like obviously I've lived in a few different places. I've had a few different computers. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's not nothing particularly uh, exciting. I don't have like a great, you know, setup for anything like that. And more often I'm, you know, hunched over like this, you know, tapping away at keys, <laughs> looking at things, you know, <laughs> um, these, these days you can, you can copy and paste your Japanese into a search engine and see what comes up. But back in the old days, you were, uh, you were cracking open a, a dictionary. Mm -hmm. Right. So things have changed, but the process is, um, the process is, uh, you know, at its heart still, um, you got to, uh, you have to know what you know and know what you don't know. And when you know that you don't know something, you have to seek help. Hmm. What does it, what does this feel like? You know, when someone says this, what does this word mean? What does this phrase mean? Um, ask a Japanese person. There's limitations to what I know. There's limitations to my feeling of what something feels like in Japanese. Someone might say, if I, you know, so you have to develop your your, your sense that you don't know something. That's a really important, um, it's a really important skill in this. Because if you just, you know, you think you know everything, you're going to like make mistakes. So you got to stop yourself and say, wait a second, like, I don't know why this character would say this here. Mm -hmm. And 99% of the time, if you get to a point like that, where you say, like, I don't know what the intent of this line is, it's because you made a mistake. You missed something. Because authors don't write stuff. You don't write a line. If you think about it, if you're writing, if you're writing something, every line that you write has a reason. Yeah. There's an intent that the author put it, every line in there. Mm -hmm. So you, as a translator, should understand the intent of every line. What's this line supposed to do? Uh, is it conveying information? Is it conveying emotion? Is it... Um, explaining to the player an important part that they have to remember for later. Mm. And it's so easy to miss all that stuff. And no, we don't usually have access to, um, hell, we don't have access to the uh, R&D team. If, mm. You have to understand, it, uh, let's say this for the audience, a very important thing that they should know. Mm -hmm. um, your game localization is being done in-house sometimes. So which is to say by the company, mm. in the company, so you've got translators in the company that are able to talk to the R&D team. They probably have a lot more time than your uh, uh, outsourced translations because they could have started earlier. They have complete access to the R&D team, mm -hmm. probably, probably, should be. Um, whereas um, most of the 
most of the localizations are not done in-house. They're being done through um, localization companies, translation companies. And um, mm -hmm. depending on the situation, you know, you you probably don't have access to the uh, the R&D team very well. Maybe you can put up a Google Doc and they'll answer your questions. Mm -hmm. But in the good cases, when you have a client that understands, you know, understands the, the needs of a localizer, they'll put you into contact with them. You'll have good communication. Doesn't happen often enough, but sometimes it does. You'll have time. You'll have creative, um, the creative, uh, the right to make creative decisions mm -hmm. that will be understood. And those are the things that allow a translator to say, all right, I'm going to, you know, I'm part of this dev process. You know, I'm going to make a great game that people will love and I'm going to you know, put all my heart into it. I'm going to reach those emotions. I'm mm -hmm. going to spend that extra time. Um, I'm not going to translate um, the line directly. I'm going to think about the way I would say it, as a native speaker, the way that will pierce their heart, you know, the way that will make them feel angry or whatever it takes time for God's sake. The original writer took time. Why would anyone think that a team of four or five people, <laughs> you know, are going to, would you read a book that was written by four people? <laughs> right. Is it going to be good? I mean, what, you know, I, I uh, it's going to, it's going to have issues, isn't it? I can't, it's too many cooks in the kitchen for. Yeah. It's going to be, a, it's going to be a little inconsistent, better. isn't it? Yeah. You know, so, um, but anyway, what I was trying to say is that um, if you're if you are uh, not within the company, you have to overcome a lot of stuff, um, yeah. lack of context and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So the process is always the same, but the um, the tools that we get to do a good job vary. Mm -hmm. Maybe we don't get enough mm -hmm. time. Maybe we don't we don't get enough context. We don't get to see the game. We don't get to play the game. We don't, you know. <laughs> they don't give you anything. It feels like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it, you know, already I thought it was a marvel that anything gets made, you know, just yeah, yeah. to begin with. But then to mm -hmm. look at exporting the product and, and what it goes through there when people don't really have access to enough is just another yeah. layer of the marvel. Yeah. Of the yeah. Do you think... uh Modern video games are missing something that video games in the '90s had, or maybe before. Is what if, and if so, yeah, what I think so. I think that is. Yeah, yeah I'm, you know, this is going to be one of those things that makes me sound like a really old. That's old okay. Dude. It's all right. We yell at yeah. clouds here. It's cool. All right, all right. So, <laughs> um, I think that there's a tension between. Um, I think that a couple things. One, um, creativity thrives in a a lit an environment where there's limitations mm -hmm. because yes. in the process of trying to work around those limitations, people um, must be creative. Mm -hmm. Right. And so in the old days we had uh, such tremendous limitations with regards to um, memory on devices that um, game creators had to be very economical, let's say mm -hmm. in, right. Um, so that's one thing working. Another thing that I think is working is I think that there's a tension between how much a person sees and how much a person imagines. Mm -hmm. And so as things became more crystal clear and photorealistic and we got hair mechanics and boob mechanics and, um, <laughs> right. You know, we got, you know, people specializing in, you know, how water droplets form on, you know, windows right. and stuff like that and you're using built-in hardware that already does these effects for you mm -hmm. right so there's a sameness that we see in games now um mm -hmm. that bothers me there's also a i felt this from the very beginning when we went to cds this is where i'm going to sound really old guys so buckle mm -hmm. buckle up no, no problem um, well the thing was um it was always for me, it was always working within these limitations. I was working at Konami when we were in the 16 bit period. And right as I, right towards the end of my career there, we got Sony. Mm -hmm. And it was, okay. C okay, so CDs are going to win. And it's been a boom for me. But um, since then, it's been a relentless pursuit towards 
graphics because mm-hmm. graphics are the thing that you can show on um, on commercials and advertising. It's why we show cutscenes. Well, well, now it's almost the same, but um, you know, it's yeah. easier to show cut to advertise a game with cutscenes that look great. So mm-hmm. for a long time, um, people were trying to uh, you know just make really great looking cutscenes, and then the gameplay itself was like totally different, right? Mm-hmm. Well, now you've got you know um, these incredible graphics moving at I don't know how many frames per second, and um, it's like, and you press a button and the character fucking spins the axis mil- you know, a million different times and does all the different moves and chops off the head. And you only, you only press one freaking button and he did that or you press three buttons and he did that. And it's like, did I do that? Or did the, so mm, there's like a, there's a, there's a mismatch between your input and what you're seeing on the screen. Not yeah. to mention the fact that you can't really see if you're playing the game. I don't think it, you're just trying to collide a couple of things together right Mm -hmm. in a certain timing you Mm -hmm. can't see if you're watching a person play a game you may see all these different like you know wisps of smoke curling around the Mm -hmm. dragon's tail as you but like you're just moving like super fast and you're just i don't know so what is at the heart Mm -hmm. of the video game is it you trying to collide two different things together with your Mm -hmm. slight movement on the things or is it are you watching it as a spectator oh it was so cool the way he chopped off the head or Mm -hmm. like i don't so I guess what I the old the old me really wants to say that games didn't get better. Um, ha, game, games haven't got more fun, but what we have done is we've cranked up your we've cranked up your inability. You know how you can't watch old movies now. Mm, it can be hard. Is it, yeah. is it true for games too? I mean, is it, it now be. the case? So that's that's sad, you know. I mean, it um, depends on what someone's really pr- priority is in a game. And mm, for mm, me, mm. most games are really about the joy of control. Um, I love games that are story based, but mm. I will almost always choose something that is a joy to control over a story based game. A joy? To, you mean the actual control? You mean your like, input the, on the? Yeah. Yeah. So like if you say like, oh, I want to drive, uh, I want to drive a Civic versus I want to drive a Lamborghini, mm, or something, mm, you're going to mm, feel mm. the difference in control with those two mm, vehicles. Mm, mm, and you might mm, say like, oh, yeah, you know yeah, what? Yeah. I think I'd rather drive this Lamborghini. Right. For me, that's the thing, right? I, I love the feel of Street Fighter 2. Every single right. hit in that game, the sound effects, the vision, every little thing about it, the hit boxes and hurt boxes, every little thing satisfies me in some way. The control is a joy. So isn't the isn't the For problem me, that it doesn't matter the, if I go back to something old as long as it feels good to control. Mm, 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 okay. Um, isn't the lack of change in in the interface, mm-hmm. our you know our controllers, the lack of change in that? If you look at the change in the graphics, and the and the hardware and all that stuff and the frame rate and all that stuff, versus the change in the controllers. Mm-hmm. Mm. Isn't that an issue? Isn't that a problem? Isn't that, you know, doesn't I mean, a player have to feel? I say it was the, the 3D, mm-hmm. the analog. Right, 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 right. So if a player doesn't feel that they are controlling, in control of what mm-hmm. they're doing on screen, there's this, um, I don't know, Iwakan, I don't know how you say um <clears throat> is, yeah, um, that's I know what you mean. <laughs> I don't know that uh, they disconnect. Yeah, is a, kind a, of a feeling, a feeling of um, um, uncomfortableness. Mm. Iwakan, a feeling of uncomfortableness mm. that you get when when you when your character on the screen is doing all these things the way that you didn't do. It's this mm. mismatch, you know. Mm. Yeah. So. Yeah, for me, I I would definitely say I've I've felt that before, and I regard it as a a disconnect between my actions disconnect and actions yeah and I, I i can't i can hardly play 3d games you know because mm-hmm. you're moving in this like you know with a two-dimensional controller of, you know right and left and like i can't get it yeah, pe- people are getting lost in 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 those making games into movies and I feel yeah. like that is the wrong direction for video games for mm-hmm. the most part mm-hmm. i mean mm-hmm. rpgs have always been a part of video games i guess but it just seems like there's 
this is why I like the switch and I'm, I'm glad that it's, uh, you know, popular even in 2022. Mm. Um, it, there's, there's more I'm of a, a focus on game. Yeah, yeah. More of a focus mm. on gameplay and making games games and not trying to make games into movies because mm -hmm. yeah, like, mm. like we've all yeah. been saying, it's, you don't want to watch a game. You want to play the game. You want to right. control. And for me, yeah, I'm similar to Mike too. It's the, the joy to control. I want to feel, I want to feel movement kind of, mm, 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 I want mm, to mm, feel mm, 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 mm. like gymnastics in a sense. I always loved uh, platformers for mm, that reason. Mm, it's, it's how mm. Mario moves. It's how they all move. Mm, That's very mm, important. Mm, Fighting mm, games mm. also. It, it's, it's, you want it to be a martial arts simulator, fantasy martial arts, I guess, but still, mm, mm. you know what I mean? That's why fighting games work for like Mike and I are big fighting game fans because that input, there's, there's no lag generally. I mean, mm. the only time you're ever really watching something maybe is Mortal Kombat when you do a fatality mm. or whatever, mm. but it's, it's pretty quick. It doesn't last like 15 fucking minutes. So, um, well, unless you hit a super combo, <laughs> super combo. Mm. Yeah. Killer it's in the modern iterations, hundred yeah. hits or something. I, I just, I just don't think that graphics, um, mm -hmm. graphics don't really connect to emotions and it's really the emotions that, um, yeah. It, I mean, you guys are talking about control, so I'm changing the subject slightly. I'm talking about the. Um, I mean, if we if we look at it through like Kojima's games, for example, mm -hmm. um, people love Metal Gear Solid. Did they love it because the graphics were so great, or mm -hmm. you know, what 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 was it about that that you loved? I got to tell you, so I was probably thirteen or fourteen. Metal Gear One comes out, and at that time, it was so new that it's something. True. Something could yeah. look like a movie. It had, cre had yeah. opening credits like a movie. Sure. Uh, the PlayStation 1, because we had just come from Super Nintendo. So right. to go make this jump to something so cinematic yeah. so quickly, it was absolutely <laughs> mind-blowing. But I, I feel agree. like it's it's it was good then, but it's just not what games need now. Uh, kinda. Right. I mean, so I guess... I guess what we're saying is that there's a, um, there's a, a, what's the, my English is so, so shitty now. Um, <laughs> there's a, what do you, what do you call it when that there's a point of no uh, point diminishing of, uh, returns. Thank you. Thank mm. you. Diminishing returns. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, we're past the point. <laughs> yeah. We're way, we're way past, we're way past it. We're way yeah. past it. So it's yeah. funny because I was just thinking the other day about, um, I think it was, is it Brian De Palma who uh, directed Scarface? Brian is that right? Uh, oh, yeah, I think it was De Palma. Yeah. So yeah. in any case, I remember reading years ago and, you know, shower thoughts, ideas just jump in mm -hmm. your head at times. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about him talking about the criticisms of the movie for being too violent, too graphic. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. he said that his his complaint was it's not actually too graphic. The scene mm. that he was getting dinged for most was something like where they took a chainsaw to someone in the bath mm. or whatever. Mm. He's mm. like, but if you watch the scene, you don't see the scene. You see a blood splatter on the shower curtain. You don't actually see what's happening. But that's, right. that combination of sound and vision was too strong for some people to handle. Right. And I think that that's kind of, I, I, I get the feeling that's what you're getting at with the uh, yeah. more of these graphics and realism fill in the, the less yeah. we get from it. Exactly. That's exactly right. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's very well put. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, why do you think Japan has been so successful in selling their pop culture worldwide? They always have been mm -hmm. hundreds of years. You know, mm. in the in the in the Meiji period, you know, or maybe even earlier, you know, um, when foreigners came over here and they, you know, they saw the uh, woodblock prints, you know, for example, and you know, mm. the Japanese would notice, oh, these uh, these foreigners, they love the they, the ones with the dragons. <laughs> they sell better than the you know than the other ones. It's true, not many Japanese people buy the ones with the dragons, but the the foreigners like them because they're exotic, you know. And so this is you know, hundreds of years ago, you know, they, they, they made more, uh, more dragon ones, you know, mm -hmm. but the West has always uh, been so obsessed by the Orient. <laughs> so what you're really asking is why is the West obsessed by the Orient? And I encourage people to read uh, early books about Orientalism about this. Uh, mm -hmm. There's Saeed, 
Um, but basically the idea is that um, Japan and the, the East and the other is the other by which we Westerners define ourselves. Mm -hmm. We are, we are not that. So we are this because we are not that. Mm -hmm. And everyone, you know, in psychology, you must have an other in order to figure out what you are. And so, you know, that dude's an asshole and I'm not an asshole. That person's, mm -hmm. you know, Mm, and I so we, we always define ourselves by others and uh, the East is the other by which we define ourselves. And then uh, Japan is this uh, island nation that people have this romantic idea that it's sort of unspoiled and you know, unspoiled mm -hmm. original culture. And, um, and, and it's just, I, I can't even handle all the different ways that Japan gets <laughs> used and thrown about to fit into the culture wars of of the west because mm. uh, nobody here you know is thinking about those those things um mm. the people that seize upon it that think that it's this uh place where um now oh, just fill in the blank man i mean everybody yeah. uses they yeah. they use they use japan as a uh, as a um is that the word right Right, we're tabula rasa, is that the right word? A blank slate mm -hmm. to uh, to you know put their own ideas about what, mm -hmm. but they're really talking. They're really defining themselves. They're, they're not defining Japan. They're they're using Japan as an opportunity to sort of yeah <clears throat> figure out who they are or what their priorities are. And so Japan's just this other thing. Mm -hmm. Right. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. And so Japan and Japan knows that, you know, they, they know that um, they, they, they know the appeal that they have and they play it up. Mm -hmm. The companies you know, do, that? but it seems like the average Japanese person, at least in my experience, mm. is always really shocked by how much Japan is liked and well, how uh, yeah. people are. And ironically, you know, they also use, uh, they also don't understand uh, America at all, the average Japanese person. And they, they think yeah. America is a completely different thing than it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, I think most Americans think the same. <laughs> it's very different. Maybe, maybe. Um, I'm sorry, Andrew, what did you just say about you just, what did you just say? Oh, uh, what did I say? Sorry. I'm, I'm blanking <laughs> out now. Saying, saying that Japanese people are generally surprised oh, that yeah. uh, their culture is so beloved abroad. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. They, mm -hmm. they, they do have a bit of a complex of uh, inferiority towards the towards mm -hmm. more than a bit of one. It seems like there was some old in in old times there was Europeans came over like oh chopsticks can't believe you use that or you know they they were. Well, they were always looked up upon, looked up to in some ways, but it seems like some of those facets and way in history sunk into the culture there and they're surprised that anybody likes Japan at all. Sometimes it feels like it's like, well, you realize you're probably number two most popular pop culture in the world after America's pop culture, mm. you know, but, but they're mm. blissfully unaware. Mo most Japanese people I, I find. Um, yeah. It's a, I think it's a, it's a generational thing. Yeah. 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 I guess so. Yeah. It's interesting. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any advice for those wanting to learn Japanese? Mm. Um, yeah, I guess I would say, first of all, figure out what, how you want to use it because uh, this idea that you get fluent in Japanese and then that's that. And everyone <laughs> has this sort of same level of fluency. You know, they have these JLP, J, J, Japanese proficiency, JLP, yeah. And, you know, people think that this is like the proper way of defining like um, fluency or something like this. Or, But uh, as I said, my goal was, um, was always to just be able to s get into a really you know, normal conversation with people. And like, mm -hmm. I'm incredibly good at it. <laughs> like my Japanese okay. is really, really good on that level, on that level. Uh -huh. But, you know, um, there's people who speak a different kind of Japanese that are better, you know, much better. Uh, there's people who speak uh, my type of 
every day Japanese better than me. And there's people who speak, um, who can um, speak, uh, let's say, philosophical language or the, the politics. They know political, you know, jargon better. Or mm -hmm. so, depending on what your field is and what type of people you want to speak to and what environment that you want to speak Japanese. Um, I had literature Japanese literature professors in um, college that could probably read the the um, you know Heike Monogatari in in uh, in Japanese you know mm. but they couldn't speak you know their Japanese was was horrible you know speaking it they didn't care to speak it mm -hmm. they wanted to be able to read it so figure out what your goal is for Japanese and then work towards that um, as far as mm. JPLT uh, people talk about you know companies require this and they require that um mm -hmm. personally i took the jplt2 i don't know something like 25 years ago mm -hmm. and i passed it and uh and after that i said screw that i'm not studying for this anymore <laughs> you know if somebody <laughs> if somebody can't tell that i speak japanese really really well then mm -hmm. they don't speak japanese really really well and they don't know and mm -hmm. i don't you know <laughs> Like, yeah. you know, you know it if you see it. And I didn't really want to, you know, pursue that any further. So I don't have JPLT1, but. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's good, especially speaking as uh, an educator, you know, tests make for a nice, you know, temporary goal. But that's, right. not, that's not your but, objective. <laughs> that's right. And so um, obviously go to Japan, go to Japan. Um, no, your kanji study is it's it's not that important outside of the JP uh, LT test. I mean, you could study your they have these Anki things now or whatever that people mm -hmm. are, you know, they go to Reddit and how do should I study Japanese? And man, it's like <laughs> you don't need, you know, you don't need special tools to to learn Japanese, just like you don't really need a gym to build your body, you know. Mm -hmm. If you really were into it, you could just do push ups all day like a dude in a prison. Right. And you'll, yeah. you'll, you'll, you'll be cut, but like, you know, it's not, so it's not about the tools and it's not about that. It's about what you want to do. And, mm -hmm. and, um, when, when so people just, ask me about, uh, you know, what, what'd you, what apps can I use to learn kanji? And mm -hmm. I didn't learn via an app because mm -hmm. <laughs> this, this dates me now, but you know, in 06, when I wasn't there, the iPhone wasn't out yet. It was a 08 came mm -hmm. out in 08. For mm. one, so a lot of my kanji studying was in 06, 07, like just before mm. all that stuff. But uh, I, I want to tell them, <laughs> I want to, I tell them, I got flashcards, <laughs> I got flashcards and a notepad, and Look I wrote that. it out like a thousand times, <laughs> and like that was it. Yeah, kind of like this, but with flashcards. And then when I tell them that, well, I tell people that That's a lot great. of times it's like they don't like that answer because <laughs> they want they want to do it via an app. But I think. Kanji is just one of those things where you got to go old school. You just you got to go old school. You got to write them a th a, like a thousand times each, and that's it. But with the, no. the bar thing, like how many things out there in life where you can literally become better at by getting a little drunk and talking to people? You know what I mean? Like what a hobby, you know? That's so cool. <laughs> so I would, you know, do this and, and, and study my, <laughs> my, my kanji. kanji. And, and, I, and, and I wrote them a thousand times. You know, yeah, that's what yeah. I'm doing. And to this day, I... Sometimes I, I can't remember a kanji, but my hand remembers how to write it. Uh-huh. You know? Yeah, uh -huh. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> um, That's funny. Yeah, it's funny. We've gone to muscle memory for some things in the past. Too. Yeah. So <laughs> definitely, I agree with you, Andrew. It's, it's, it's really about old school. In fact, the less that you, the more that you use, um, like even flashcards, I really, it's only going to help you with the reading. You're not going to learn. Mm. You'll, you you're going to forget to, how to write it immediately. I mean, even Japanese people oh, are yeah. forgetting how I to know. write stuff. You know, know. so yeah, yeah, it's yeah. just not that important to be able to write it anymore. Reading is really important. So, yeah, flashcards are, are, are fine from that perspective. Um, but I think that, I think that, you know, you have to, yeah, you have to, you have to really, you have to really want to learn Japanese, man. <laughs> it's like, it, it just, yeah. Man, it's like right. it's just not easy, you know. And and as far as the as far as speaking it goes, just listen to people. Just listen to people mm -hmm. and copy them, and listen to the inflections that they use. Oh, they use this phrase. Oh, they use this phrase a little bit differently. Why do they use this phrase 
why did you say it this way instead of this way? Oh, right. Well, he's, oh, he's talking to a friend. He's talking to his mother. Oh, you know, and like, just stop talking mm -hmm. and listen a lot. And then just try to parrot people's, um, eventually you just build up so many um, patterns of saying things mm -hmm. that it becomes your own. And um, yeah, so it's, it's just pretty it's just, natural language acquisition. <laughs> time, time, time plus effort yeah. plus, you know. Yeah. So if somebody, you know, finds that their, their goal, they, they want to learn Japanese to become a mm. translator. Do you have any mm. advice for those who are, have learned and, and feel comfortable and would like to go on to become translators? Um, <clears throat> persistence, mm -hmm. um, exposure, many exposures. I mean, what I'm trying to say is that many doors will close. Mm -hmm. And that's, it's a numbers game, you know, it's like, um, you will fail many times to achieve your goal. Mm. And uh, it is the people who are persistent that will find the door that's open. And so scattergun that shit, keep going. <laughs> and, you know, there's really no, there's no, you know, there's no like how to break into the games industry as a translator thing. Mm. I mean, most of the things are, are obvious. Use the connections you have, put yourself out there. Now social media is such a big thing. Mm -hmm. um be humble be polite when you're asking for people to because you invariably have to ask people for favors don't you mm -hmm. give me a chance give me a break i've always you know so when you reach out to people bear in mind that you're you know taking their time so be polite um mm -hmm. be respectful keep doing it keep reaching out keep using the social media again be humble if you're a beginner you're not going to convince people that have been doing it for 30 years that you're not a beginner so say you're a beginner mm -hmm. um, and uh, but everybody, it's like karate, you know, everybody starts with a white belt. Mm -hmm. So we get it. We get it. And some of the white belts are going to become black belts and some are not. And so um, but it's your uh, and it's your uh, enthusiasm. Like I said before, this is not a job that can be done well unless you love it and you're willing to go the extra miles to do a good job. The easy job is going to be the poor job, right? Mm -hmm. The ones, the ones who did it quickly and easily probably didn't put in the effort. Um, so passion is an important part of this, uh, this career. Mm -hmm. And um, so show your passion, show your interest, show your love um, and, and keep, and keep knocking on doors and eventually a door will, will open, but it won't, it's not going to be your first door probably and and if it was your first door that opened then you're kind of fucked because you never went through the process of making enough mistakes to because you will you know you'll get screwed eventually and then you're gonna have to open another door and you're like oh i don't know how to open doors and now you're 30 and you can't open a door so <laughs> better to be in your 20s and make a lot of mistakes and keep mm -hmm. going if it's what you really want to do um it's not an easy career especially mm -hmm. now it's very competitive a lot of people want to do it yeah. prices aren't aren't good mm. yeah all right well thank you very much for that mm. uh before we call it a uh, wrap it up here i just uh i remember before you mentioned that uh you were having uh, one of the translations sound a little like thor and since mm. both of us are very much into comics i was curious uh if you could share some of the comics you enjoyed when you were younger i only Hang on, hang on. You know, just can can I? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> he is for the listener. He is going to get what we think to be one of one of his comics out of his collection. Uh, or he could be taking a break. It has been a little while. <laughs> and uh, we're uh, we're approaching the two hour mark, so he is uh, being very generous with uh, providing us with uh, what will probably be a uh visual <laughs> here we go it's coming back well, I, I don't have many comics now because uh i said lost my comic book collection when I, our house burned down oh, oh man uh, all right but, uh, okay but uh but i still have a few and uh i was always a marvel fan so thor avengers iron man uh, uh x-men uh, uh, maybe your um 
headphones are on backwards because I think the mic's in the wrong spot. Yeah. There we go, maybe. That is a pro. Okay, a there pro. we go. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, I was yeah. into Thor, Conan, Avengers, X Men. Nice. Doctor Strange, you know, all that stuff. Fantastic Four. Oh, that's great. Um, I'll, sh I'll show you a few comics I got. Um, yeah. You know, here. Oh, mm -hmm. nice. Look at that. Mm -hmm. Hey. That's a Conan nice. man thing. Look at yeah. this. These are cool. I think I think it's the first appearance of a man thing. Uh, That's awesome. Oh, wow. Um, and, you know, they got some nice. Uh, Ooh, an old These all look like they wor there. they're worth something for sure. Nice. Howard, Howard the, the Duck. duck. <laughs> duck well, oh, that's a, I like that cover. Yeah, isn't that great? I love that cover. Yeah. yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> I mean, how can you beat? Look at that cover. I mean, Jesus Christ, man. That's awesome. Kirby, yeah. man. Kirby. Yeah, I hated Kirby. True. I I did not like Kirby when I was collecting, but I love him now. <laughs> oh wow. Love yeah. Kirby. Sometimes it just works like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, some others here. Another uh, Conan showing up. Yeah. This is great. Daredevil and Thor. Dare, Daredevil dresses up as Thor, you know. <laughs> like he, he puts on a you know fake he's got his cane turned into a you know Mjolnir and you know. Oh wow! This is beast. Oh, huh? nice. I love yeah. that font. Amazing adventures. I've never yeah, seen the, this series. Well, this was like the first appearance of you know the beast kind of thing. This is great. Anybody know what this is? Coming up, no, Elric. No. That's familiar, but no. You know, do you know who Elric is? No. Uh, no, I'm, no. No. Okay. <laughs> Another amazing adventures with beast. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. Oh, these oh, are that's, cool. That's a good shot. I love the use of the oh, shading first, and all on that, Conan. Uh, first appearance of Red Sonia. Oh, wow. wow. Okay. I see that's got a bit of a different case to it. A stronger. Uh, yeah, maybe. Case. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what if number one? This is a good one. Oh, Spider nice. Man joined oh, wow. the Fantastic all these, Four. All wow. these look very like they might be worth something. Well, you know, they because, also look uh, very loved. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> 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 These were some of the ones I managed to save, but I had I had Conan number one that I let go. <laughs> oh man! Yeah. Uh, no, that's actually really I, cool. I, I have some great Avengers ones that I gave to my daughter. She's really into comics too. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. That's nice. cool. She's she's so into Avengers. Oh, nice. Um, I'm de oh, I'm sorry, Zoe. Not Avengers. X Men. X Men. I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> okay. She'll kill me. Yes. Well, we can edit that. Yeah. Well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we'll just we'll dub you we'll dub over it i love the comics but but no i was so influenced by uh you know by the language in comics it really influenced my writing for sure okay yeah that's great that's awesome all right well yeah. thank you so much for sharing that with us it's really cool yeah. and thank you so yeah. much for coming yeah. and chatting yeah. with us all this time i know yes, it's a thank lot you. of time you know and you're a busy guy so we really do yeah. appreciate it yes i do appreciate it that was a lot of fun for me our guest this week is Jeremy Blaustein. He is the CEO of Dragon Baby. Dragon Baby is a globally focused localization company headquartered in Tokyo. They employ a team of local language experts spread around the world, each passionate and experienced video gamers. Jeremy has been a gamer since the age of eight and grew up playing arcades, PC games, Atari, ColecoVision, and television, TurboGrafx, Neo Geo, PlayStation, and just about every game system ever created. He got his professional start in the industry at Jellico in Chicago in 1990 as an associate producer. In 1996, Jeremy struck out on his own as an entrepreneur, working with companies such as Sony, EA, Konami, Ubisoft, Square Enix, and Activision to launch some of gaming's best known IPs, such as Metal Gear Solid, Dragon Quest, Silent Hill, Sui Colden, Castlevania, Shadow Hearts, Ape Escape, Valkyrie Profile, and many others. He has also translated 17 seasons of the Pokemon anime and more than half a dozen of their premier films. Jeremy is widely known and respected for his passionate commitment to quality. Dragon Baby LLC is a video game localization company founded and led by renowned 25-year veteran Japanese to English game translator Jeremy Blaustein, who is famous for his work on Metal Gear Solid, Silent Hill, Castlevania Symphony of the Night, and countless other AAA titles. It is dedicated to the highest standards of both quality and creativity in game localization. Based in Japan, Dragon Baby is a full-service localization company that offers translation services from English into all major languages, as well as less common Asian-to-Asian -Asian language pairs such as Chinese-to-Japanese, Japanese-to-Korean, 
and the like. In addition, Dragon Baby, Dragon Baby is well experienced in voice recording that offers a tremendous increase in the quality of the product. Dragon Baby works tirelessly to seek out the most talented and professional linguists all over the world, testing them on a wide range of skills that are applicable to game localization, such as accuracy, creativity, dialogue writing, research thoroughness, and the like. All linguists are proficient in the use of cat tools and are always eager and enthusiastic participants in the process of game content creation. As a small company, Dragon Baby is highly responsive to our client needs, and the CEO, Jeremy Blaustein, guides all projects personally with a firm and experienced hand. Dragon Baby has translated over 10 million words, completed over 200 projects, 31 years of experience, and works in 14 languages. All right, well, thank you for listening. If you liked this episode, please subscribe to us on YouTube, Spotify, or Apple Music. Yes, and if you really liked us, please become a member at our Patreon, which is at patreon.com slash gamingguiden. There we have two tiers. Uh, the first tier is uh, our shout out slash uh, tip jar tier. So that is basically the $1 tier and that gets you a shout out on our board of names, <laughs> which is going to be on our Instagram. And uh, then the, two, the uh, tier number two, the second tier, which is the $5 tier gets you access to our bonus episodes and um this is an interview series here mainly but the behind the paywall uh five dollar tier episodes will be more mike and i uh handling different gaming topics and any kind of topic that's related to what we talk about here on gaming guidance just chatting just chatting things like that so yeah and um after we pass a uh, certain goals uh we will one of the we'll use our funding to uh help our retro gaming habits so uh i'll uh you know you can contribute to my quest to get a neo geo cdz and mike i'd love to get myself a nice little mr fpga device so i can play Ooh. those old games on the CRT and not have to worry about that original hardware crapping out on me and all that jazz. Woo! And you know, uh, we will use uh, that. Um, we will use this as uh, content for Patreon and maybe even for the for the main show in season two. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. But uh, that is basically it. We want to thank Jimmy Blaustein once again. Awesome interview. It thank was you. it was thank a pleasure. You. All right. Peace. See you later.